Hello, and welcome to the Brave New Weed Podcast. And now, here's your host, Zheng Dujian. Welcome to episode three of the Brave New Weed Cast. So before we get started, I want to take a moment to remind everyone to help support us. You know, you can do this quickly, easily, and very inexpensively by visiting patreon.com forward slash brave new weed. And you can contribute as little as $1 per month. Come on, guys, $1 per month. That's three cents a day. So there are all sorts of additional goodies you get if you contribute a little more. But one buck, it'll get you advanced access to our episodes, and it'll help keep this podcast going in the future. But now that we've got that business out of the way, let's get to the fun stuff. Uh, allow me to introduce my wonderful co-host, Mr. Matthew Hendershot. Happy to be here as always, Joe. It's going to be a great episode. I think it is tonight. Edibles are one of those topics that people either love edibles or they can't stand them. And the reason is because they can't control the dose. And we're going to talk about some new revolutionary techniques in the, in the art of edible making and consuming. I just wanted to say I love edibles. What do you love about edibles? You know, it's it's a very different beast than than smoking. Completely. And there's just so many great ways. There's so many great vehicles for delivery, whether it's sweets or whether it's savories or whether it's beverages or you know tinctures or whatever. I, I just think it's a really interesting and different way to consume. But the uh, problem is, yeah, and of course, come you, on, yeah, what's the problem? The one leg of the gummy bear that makes you speak to, you know, Lord knows whatever is you just out cower, of the cower in the corner for a too, too long. And, and I just, you know, I don't get that. I don't get who eats one gummy bear or you know, part of I, one gummy bear. I was at a party and I broke my own rule. Somebody said, here's a bunch of brownies. I said, oh, great. What's the dose? How much is in one? They said, oh, it's the perfect amount. Don't worry. I said, how do you know? I followed the recipe. Stupid me. I believe the guy. <laughs> I ate the recipe. brownie. I sat at a party, literally in the corner for two hours, and, uh, almost crying. Yeah. And it wasn't because the people were scary. I just was so unhappy. Yeah, it's, it's too much, too intense, and not enjoyable. I mean, like something like a brownie, you should be able to enjoy on the level of a brownie. Yes. Uh, like because I like brownies. I want to eat one. I don't want to have to worry about eating a tiny piece of a small brownie or same with a chocolate bar. You hand me a chocolate bar, I want to eat the whole chocolate bar. Okay. But no, I, by that point, I've ingested 500 plus milligrams of that THC is... and I can't function for the next day and a half. Well, speaking of non-functioning, let's talk about some of the news this week. Let's In particular, our great attorney general. The ongoing saga of Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions. I'm still, I'm still holding on, Joe. I, I just feel like this rhetoric is not going to fall directly on the heads of cannabis, I cannabis users. Do not understand your optimism, but that's another story. We'll I, talk I about that. Let's go to the news. Come on, let's, let's go to the news. The biggest news this week is Jeff Sessions, who wants to revert back to the drug war. He wants to get the drug war cooking again. He wants to go back to the John Ashcroft era of giving people mandatory minimum sentences. He wants to crack down on drugs again. And I wanted to talk to Joe Bondi, who's one of the great trial lawyers in the United States, who's defended drug criminals for many years to get his take on what's really going on Yes, here. yes. So we see in the news this morning the memo coming out of the office of Jeff Sessions uh, basically rescinding the two memorandum of directions for charging and for sentencing that were issued by uh, Eric Holder mm -hmm. in, I think, 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, I mean, is this it? Is this the return to the Ashcroft era of mandatory minimum sentences, fill up the private prisons? Uh, well, yes, it is. And, um, you know, when you ask, is it the return to the Ashcroft era? Um, in 2003, John Ashcroft, who was our then attorney general, issued a memorandum to all of the U.S. attorneys in the Justice Department in which he directed that everybody, uh, every line prosecutor should seek to charge the most serious offense that they could prove and to seek the highest sentence 
that they could obtain. And that would mean, of course, to seek in every instance where applicable a mandatory minimum sentence. So we've now returned to that era from an era that had begun really in 2010 with Eric Holder and then 2013 and 14, in which he, as the attorney general, issued these explicit memoranda to all the U.S. attorneys in the country, directing them in certain cases to not charge the mandatory minimum sentence and to allow low-level garden variety, nonviolent offenders in cases where otherwise a minimum would be applicable to plead to a lesser included offense that didn't carry a minimum. So now we've, the pendulum has swung completely back to the Ashcroft era. Hmm. Hey, I, I want to push on that a little bit. A lot of the language that we see uh, coming out of the, the Justice Department these days is focused on violent crime, uh, violent crime relating to drugs, and, and drug trafficking. What does this sort of statement coming out of Jeff Sessions mean for recreational marijuana users and medical marijuana users? Not much, Matt. I mean, in, 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 in the end, use of cannabis is separate and apart from the type of federal offense that would trigger a you know, first off an enforcement action even under this this more stringent rubric but you know use doesn't trigger those mandatory minimum sentences so perhaps up the chain others you know should be concerned particularly say in the black market which when you look at the holder memo there are certain criteria that, that, the, that the feds were directed to evaluate and if those were met, then the question of whether it was even a federal case was raised, you know. So I think now you might find that, you know, some of these marijuana operators may find themselves the target of enhanced federal enforcement. Yes. Yeah. Are we, are we talking about grow houses? Are we talking about dispensaries? Well, 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 it's interesting. Talking. Let's take the easy ones. The low-hanging fruits are the ones that are outside what they call the Cole Memorandum. These would be the black market operators per se, the ones who are cultivating cannabis, not selling it to a dispensary, not doing it pursuant to law. Those would be the people who, I mean, maybe two or three years ago, a small grow might not have been on the federal government's radar given this lax charging and, and, and sentencing policy. But now those smaller grows may well be on the radar, yes. Mm -hmm. Then you've got, of course, this whole, we're going to see what happens with the coal memo. I believe it will be modified in some respects and in the large measure kept. We'll know that in July when Jeff Sessions' uh, Justice Department task force returns their recommendations to him and he draws his conclusions. But I would imagine there will also be a number of entities, businesses, people running them, who are also now in the crosshairs and who you know may well not have been operating their licensed business you know, fully, fully uh, pursuant to their state's laws. Huh. So what I'm kind of understanding from, from speaking to you about this is that in states where we've gone through the process of legalizing medical marijuana or recreational marijuana um, and everybody's playing by the rules, then the, in the world of marijuana, we might be okay. But here's the thing. I mean, that's a bunch of ifs and buts, and it's not really reflective of, of the reality. The okay. reality is that in Colorado or Washington or Oregon or California, many people are engaged still in the unlawful cultivation of cannabis uh, and the distribution of cannabis by the truckload. Uh -huh. And, you know, these are people who maybe were the beneficiaries recently of federal defunding with this, the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment that's been continued at least till September in the sense of the feds were, you know, um, perhaps not as interested in entering those jurisdictions. But, you know, there remains a vibrant, viable black market that I, I think dwarfs the legitimate cannabis industry in the United States still. And sure. then there's the question of the hybrid. Are there any people who are now in the lawful market who perhaps weren't at some point? Are there any people who are in the lawful market that are nonetheless engaged in diversion or unlawful practices? And I think that that's going, this sets the stage now for increased enforcement, including in marijuana cases. And it also sets a stage for the beginnings of an incursion into, you know, state industry. Okay. Um, so 
with these harsher penalties, these these maximum uh, expenditures of what the the rule book allows, um, what are what are the negative effects that we're likely to see from this change in policy? Well, I mean, it's look, there, there's federal sentencing guidelines, which is kind of like the rule book, and these are statutes we're talking about, laws enacted by Congress that have a five year minimum, a ten year minimum, in the case of a repeat offender, a twenty year minimum, or a you know even a life sentence for a third time offender. So. Unless you're going to be doing life, here's the impact. First off, there's really very scant evidence that enforcing mandatory minimum sentencing laws really reduces crime. And, and to the contrary, Matt, you can make a pretty good argument that you know long terms in incarceration help create this whole underclass of unemployable, hardened recidivists who have no <laughs> remaining family ties. Right? Yeah, your, no your guy pops for a joint is now shacking up with murderers and uh, people yeah. with and they get out And they become the new underclass because these are people who are going to get out. And they're going to take a nonviolent drug offender, for example, and based simply on quantity, say 5.1 kilos of cocaine instead of 4.9 kilos of cocaine, send them to jail for 10 years instead of five years, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's just the pivots are going to be like that. It's going to be, oh, it was only 4,999 grams. But what about the guy? It's 5,001 grams, you know? So there's going to be, uh, in places where there had been reasoned discretion that could be exercised in light of a cluster of characteristics, the person's life, where they came from, why they committed a crime, what their level of involvement was, you know, to things like quantity. Um, Now we instead just kind of close off that whole line of consideration and close off that whole level of, of human empathy and make it this cut and dried process that involves only a number. Hmm. And, and, and I guess I, lastly, uh, to wrap up, like why, what, what is the, the reason for the default to the law and order, a uh, hard line attitude? Like what is the political benefit they're, they're hoping to achieve from this? I mean, this is a fascinating political science question, not really so much about politics. This is really goes to the issue of, do you believe in the inherent good of people or the inherent bad of people. You know, on the one hand, we have, you and I can say, oh my God, we're locking young men and women of merit away, right, for these long sentences and ruining their lives and ruining Over their lives. And for frequently, what, a nonviolent offense engendered by poverty. And what do you do? You repeat the generational cycle, right, Matt? We grew up with Nancy Reagan and Just Say No and the war on drugs and all the people who were young men and women principally of color going to jail then, have now raised children and we're repeating a generational cycle now where parents are being removed from kids again and education's being thwarted and there's no real treatment to the extent that there could be or job training. Instead, what we're doing is we breed this, this sinister, cynical point of view you know, in the larger culture where we say, I have a moral judgment and these are bad people and these are oftentimes bad people of color, or bad inner city people, or bad poor people. And we make a moral judgment about them because of our belief in this, you know, drug laws as being good when harsh. And if that's your point of view, then you breathe like a negative causation into everything that you ascribe to that human being. And so why do Republicans always default to law and order stuff? I mean, look, <clears throat> one could say that there's confusion out there, and the antidote to it is what? A crackdown. Right? More rules mean more order, don't they? You lock up the bad guy on the outside, and you don't really have to deal with the demons within. And um, again, it's all just part of this larger finger-pointing, suspicious cynicism that we appear to be breeding these days. Okay, so so what are what are our options? What do we do? Do we need to be uh, fighting for a full scale impeachment? Is there things on the state level, like with Colorado, where they can bar uh, state level employees from engaging in any federal enforcement? Like, what are our options to defend ourselves against this? Well, look, I mean, that's a broad. These are very big questions. Let's start with the simple one, which is don't engage in, in criminal activity. Okay. Okay. And certainly don't, don't trigger a mandatory minimum sentence, right? Then what can All right, you do? How do I do? avoid a mandatory minimum sentence? Well, well, you don't traffic more than 100 kilos of pot, right? 
um, or uh, more than 100 grams of heroin, and then you don't face five years in the joint. Don't traffic okay. a ton of pot, and you won't go to jail for the 10 years. But look, what we can do is this. It's, it's not like we can hum a bar. It becomes a movement right now. We've got an attorney general, and this is his bent, and we all have known that he's on a law enforcement uh, and law and order tear. And here is a reflection of something not really surprising, very, very disappointing. But I think what we can do is we can lobby our Congress people. We can ask our elected officials as constituents to, you know, weigh in on the Justice Department's policy. Right? Public opinion, I believe, is in, in favor of ending mass incarceration. I believe, at least yeah. I, maybe I'm skewed as a, a person living in on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, right, and a criminal defense lawyer, but... You know, I believe that there's no real purpose served by expending the billions and billions of dollars we do every year on creating this criminal underclass of people who are hidden in these prisons. And if we just keep telling our elected officials that, maybe we'll be able to make a change. But it's not like you're going to be able to impeach Jeff Sessions. This is not something that could lead to the impeachment of Donald Trump, right? It's the act of the Justice Department. But I do note, and we can end here, that the Cole Memorandum, which is in place to enable states with cannabis laws, recreational and medical, you know, to operate, to have, have guidelines for lawful operation that doesn't trigger federal enforcement. That memo is still in effect. And the Sessions memo that came down yesterday um, explicitly rescinds, by footnote, only those two Eric Holder memoranda. And certainly he could have rescinded the Cole memorandum. So for now... You know, I have some cautious optimism that large tracts of the coal memorandum will be kept in place and that, you know, cannabis patients and users in recreational states will still be able to you know, benefit through their state legal systems. Well, thank you for explaining all this and thank you for showing us that it's not all doom and gloom, uh, but uh, absolutely we appreciate your knowledge in this and guiding us through these sort of troubled waters. Thank you for having me, Matt. I'll talk to you very soon. Take care. So, all right, let's talk about something a little more pleasant now, back to our topic at hand, which is the edible revolution. Yeah. So our guest tonight, he blew me away with what he's done. He's come up with a way of making edibles hit in 15 minutes and low dose. Mm -hmm. Now, I know low dose sounds a little wimpy to some people. I am a huge fan of microdosing and low dose because you can really measure and limit what you're ingesting, which I think is a fantastic thing. So instead of guzzling a bottle of wine in five minutes, you're actually sipping a glass of wine. It's a much more moderate approach. And you and I both know what happens when you just eat too much. Sure, sure. There's Absolutely. no going back. And, but the, the beauty of, you know, low dose or micro dosing in any, any of these kind of regards is it, it stacks, you know? You yeah. don't have to stop at, at at five milligrams if you don't want to. You no, can, you can go you a little more. 10, 20. Or you could take a puff. Yeah, adding is always... It's uh, a beautiful thing. Uh, always a possibility, but subtracting, obviously, is, is not a possibility. So that's where I think a lot of people get into a lot of trouble with it. So our guest is Ron Silver. He's a chef. He's a chef in New York City. He owns many restaurants here. Um, and he also has an extraordinary ability. He's a food chemist. He has figured out how to extract oils and then repurpose them so that they uptake into the body within 15 minutes. So anybody who's ever eaten an edible knows it takes an hour and a half to kick in, an hour to an hour and a half, okay? This is 15 minutes. It's a beautiful thing, and I really want to talk to him about how he got into this, how he's figured it out, and what the effects are. Ron, looks like you're one of the few people in New York I know that play in the intersection of cooking, chemistry, and cannabis. Is that right? I think so. Are you are you a solitary man in this world? Well, I don't know a lot of other people actually doing it, so I guess I am. I think that's one of the uh, things of prohibition. You don't know a lot of people doing a lot of things around you even if you're right. doing the same thing. It's hard for a community to build when prohibition is in effect, don't you think? Well, I guess in a way, it certainly becomes sort of insular and secret naughty and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you feel naughty? 
<laughs> Usually I do, yes. <laughs> have, have you ever encountered a uh, like a cohort, a compatriot, someone that you already knew only in the setting surrounding cannabis for the first time? And you're like, hey, wait a minute. We're friends. How are you a part of this world as well? Well, not really. I mean, it's been a pretty new subgroup of people who sort of, I don't know. It's a, it's a strange little. It's a strange group, you know. What's a strange group? Uh, the cannabis world of, of of people in New York City, uh, or in general. Just in general, I mean, the the people that I know in New York City are a lot of uh, legal people and uh, some doctors, and you know, of course, a lot of people who consume cannabis. You know, that's the most, <laughs> the most people that I know. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of those people are, are just used to existing in a black market. Yeah. The biggest black market in the country, as far as I can see. Yeah. Hold on. Somebody's bringing us some treats. Thank God. How nice. Some treats. Um, Always good. Hold on a second. <laughs> uh, so these are basically supposed to be about six or seven milligram bottles and i suggest doing a one ounce pour those are two ounce bottles what's in them uh so these are orange soda syrup you got to shake that up a little bit soda syrup soda syrup with cannabis in it infused infused and it's fast acting how fast well it kicks in in about 15 minutes but that's sort of revolutionary don't you think yes how did you become the creator of such a thing? Well, first of all, um, you know, I did a lot of research. Uh, I did a lot of work before I came up with the thing that I have now. Uh, and what kind of research? Well, I have a book. So it's actually the first textbook I ever bought in my life. It's called Drug Delivery Strategies for Poorly Water Soluble Drugs. Poorly Water Soluble Drugs. <laughs> Which cannabis is. Uh, THC is a poorly water soluble drug. It's an oil. It is an oil. And uh, so the problem was really, you know, how to get it to be more water soluble. And there was, you know, a lot of process that went behind it. What, 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 talk us about, talk to us about some of the process, like in, in what, how do you go about doing this? I mean, obviously don't give away any trade secrets. We don't want yeah. to like birth your own competition out of this, but how do you go about well, breaking down cannabis oil into water soluble tincture? Very refreshing I mean, by the way, it has right? no flavor of cannabis in it whatsoever. Yeah. It's, oh, really it's delicious. So, um, you know, first of all, we have a patent patents pending on several of the processes behind it and there's some pretty <clears throat> there's some pretty tricky equipment with it but in general it's it's a very efficient way to distribute the the THC in a way that is very controllable so that you can have a low dose because the the, the biggest problem with cannabis edibles is that they are notoriously uncontrollable you don't know how much really you're gonna how long it's gonna take how much you're getting uh you know how long it's gonna last you know you don't think it's gonna work at all thank you very much Thanks, it takes an hour and a half to kick in and yeah. then by the time and, you, and you, you forgot that you, you forgot ate it. one and you ate another one and then you're a fucking mess by the end of that and it's terrible just cowering in the corner. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure none of us have had that experience. None of us have had that experience. Well, you know, I I have had the I've eaten like a 300 milligram Bar. gummy before just to just to see what happened, and you know I was really 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 high, but I didn't have a paranoid go to the emergency room experience. I was just wasted. For how long? Uh, well, probably really out of control high for like an hour. Oh, well, that's not so bad, huh? I was at a wedding. You have more tolerance <laughs> than most. <laughs> it's not so bad until you're at the wedding, right? <laughs> if you're home alone, safe, then it's yeah. not so bad. But it at a wedding in, in public. public. Yeah. <laughs> drooling on my suit. Mm. Um, 
so with with this delivery method, you could really choose, for example, the the sweeteners that we have. They they have like ten milligrams, for example, in one teaspoon. So if you find out what your dose is and you say, well, I like 10 milligrams at night because I sleep hard, but in the daytime, I like a little bit, or my grandmother's coming over and she likes two and a half milligrams, she can have a quarter teaspoon and it's great. And it's so, if I have tried these and I will, I will testify that the dosage is pretty accurate. Right. It's, it stays the same all the time. So, <clears throat> you know, you can control your dose and it kicks in in 15 minutes and you know exactly what you're getting, and it really answers a lot of problems. Now, Ron, if you keep things, if you keep <clears throat> cannabis in your mouth or in your rectum, that is a fast delivery. That's how it gets into the bloodstream more quickly. How does this, because it's going into the mouth but down the gullet pretty fast as a drink. Well, so basically what happens is normally when you eat a cannabis edible, it goes through your esophagus into your stomach and into your liver and then your liver goes to work on it and it the, your liver gets between two and six percent of it in say 45 minutes to three hours a lot of variables with this you get it it becomes water soluble and so it starts dissolving in your esophagus and by the time it gets to your stomach it's really mostly dissolved into your system it's absorbed Yes. Wow. Absorbed. Excuse me. Thank you. Please, please. <laughs> uh, so I'm, a, I'm a chef. I'm, I did not go to med school. I love that you're a <laughs> chef. You're a chef. Better living through chemistry, chef. That's true. So, so basically, it's it, it starts dissolving right away or absorbing into your esophagus and and takes effect in 15 minutes. Do, do you think it, it it all is absorbed? Prior to digestion, or is there? Uh, we had talked about the last time that we hung out, and you do get that sort of quick uptake from from the from the syrups. Is there another digestion phase to where, like, forty five minutes, everything that didn't get picked up I would, goes I would through say the liver there, process? There's a phase that it starts off in fifteen minutes, and it probably peaks in an hour, forty five minutes to an hour, it and then it lasts about three hours. I'd mm. say it seems that way. So I had a party a couple of nights ago where we used some of these syrups, and we were, we made cocktails out of them basically, and they were very gentle and very nice. And it was a it was a long, nice evening. It was it was people gelled at lots of same ways, and nobody got wasted. Right. You know, it, it, because we use these really low doses, which yes. is an interesting way to have a party. I mean, it's... Well, it's the best because you can have three of them and still not be out of control. But there was another thing. It was like everybody was at the same level, sort of. Maybe we all imagined we were. I don't know. But we all sort of checked in. Somebody was freaking out in there. Nobody was. <laughs> everybody was really happy, let me tell you. Um so everybody sort of got to a similar level, which was nice. It was it was different than alcohol. It was a different experience. I don't know why. Definitely, uh, alcohol is seedy. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting. What do you mean by it. that? What do you mean by I that? Mean, please think about all the seedy shit that you've ever done in your life and think just sloppy. <laughs> alcohol is involved with that, like eighty eight percent of it. Well, that, that's an interesting way to put it, and this is what you, you and I were talking about, Joe, about the the sort of um, speakeasy approach to the environment. Uh, but then also, like, if you transported that party into a bar and replaced the the THC drinks that we were enjoying with alcohol drinks, I feel Matthew like it, the it would have been more seedy. Seedy is a great adjective and, for you that. You know, even like there were there was no seediness to that party even though there was like that that swimsuit model behind the bar i did not find any kind of weirdness at that at that party it was great i well, mean listen i'm not judgmental but i didn't find i mean i've been at seedy parties and that that was not one in the old days you think of a pot party yes but this party that we were at all together was more like a um microdosed edible party Yes. It was not the same thing. It was a definitely a different <laughs> type of event. Yeah. So we had, I mean, should we talk about that? I mean, yeah, we let's talk the, about it. We had the bar with different different flavored infused syrups uh, with, you know, five or six different flavors of syrups and making sort of controlled dose cocktails, mixing 
pomegranate and ginger and lemon and stuff like that. Very delicious. <clears throat> and we had a cotton candy machine and some nice the hit candy. Of no, wait, the night. We have to talk about the cotton candy was the big hit of the night. Exactly. And is that why did the cotton candy uptake so fast and hit harder than the other substances? Well, that's a good question. So with with the syrups, you know, you've got uh, the ability to diffuse the dose within it. You know, an ounce can have three milligrams in it. With the cotton candy, if a if a teaspoon in, that night the sugar had twenty milligrams in a teaspoon in a teaspoon. So if you use two teaspoons to make a thing of cotton candy, boom, that's forty milligrams. You're out. You know. Yeah. That's a that's a and I was that's why I was telling everybody that the cotton candy is, you know, particularly to be watched out for. Here we are in New York City talking about this. How do you do this? How do you do this and operate? Uh, within the well, law or without I mean, first fear. Of all, I haven't sold anything uh, yet, in, but we're working with people in Oregon and Nevada and Colorado. And, you know, that's really where I have, you know, we have to obviously go to do the business. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you do the manufacturing? Well, like we haven't actually done any manufacturing yet. You will be. Uh, but we will be maybe in the next few months. Um, and I've been saying that for like two years. Hmm. And have you done testing in the in Oregon, Nevada, blah blah blah? Has it been out there for people to try? Yeah, sample? No, I've made lots. I've gone out there and made it for lots of people, lots of times, lots of discussion. Everybody loves it. You've test marketed it. Well, not in a not in a not in a big way, but in a cannabis way. In a cannabis way. Does yeah. it have Does it have a name in those markets? Well. I'm calling it green sugar, uh, but who knows what it's going to end up be, being called once we go get up to Madison Avenue and those guys have a whack at it with their thing, mm -hmm. their genius. cleverness. What about the uh, sodas? Do they have a name? The, the syrups for the sodas? Well, the working name is Soda Pot. See, I'm not really a, allowed to name things I necessarily, <laughs> although I, I named Bubbies. I named Bubbies. Your restaurant. Yeah. Well, it hasn't worked against you. It hasn't worked against me. What's the connection between making pies and making cannabis sugars? Is there any? Did you learn anything from your pie making life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how to survive as a pie maker. <laughs> um, well, I mean, being a chef absolutely has helped me approach this. Um, Tell me how. And, I mean it. I meant the question seriously, actually. Well, I would say that there's a lot of sort of molecular gastronomy thinking behind this, uh, these sweeteners and these syrups and, and, you know, all of this approach to things. So that's helped me. And then just the idea of uh, having an ingredient. I mean, <clears throat> these sweeteners are, are essentially an ingredient that you can use and, you know, you can really take it home and make your own cookies with it. And it's very easy to understand. It's something you can just have in your cupboard or in your medicine cabinet. And if you want a half a teaspoon at night with your tea, it's really easy to do. You don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to be like a pothead doing bong hits, watching sports all day. So yeah. Harold McGee is going to have a new... Citation in his Harold in McGee his is going right? to fucking love this. He's going to do a whole new book <laughs> on the chemistry of cannabis well, and I mean, cooking, right? I would just take a half a paragraph or page. That would be good to me, or if he even tipped his hat this way. What do you think about, um, like, do you think in terms of legalization, just being you, not that you have any, any, gene, any uh, foreseeable forecasting skills, but do you think the genie's out of the bottle, that it can't go back, or do you think... 100%. You don't yeah. think the government can crack down and stop the adult use market? There's 100% zero possibility. Why are you so confident about that? Well, I'm not. it's not that I'm confident. It's just that, there, first of all, just the sort of inkling of it being legal, everybody realized that, that it was stupid to have been illegal in the first place ever. For 80 years. Mm. And the innovations with it that have come along are so incredible and there's so much momentum with it that if it did 
if it did decide to be illegal here for some, you know, Nazi like Trump kind of reason, um, you know, the entire rest of the world would be laughing at America and all of the American innovation would go away immediately and it would go to Spain and Israel and, mm. you know, Macedonia. Oh, it, would just go under, it would just go underground again. I mean, it's all there. It's not going Plus away, it would right? go underground, yeah. You know how to make sugar. Well, I do. <laughs> Other people are going to make sugar, whether it's legal or not legal. 100%. And we're just and, not buying it in a dispensary. Oil and buds and, you know, everything. So we're now drinking the lemon, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful lemon, by the way. Really you. natural and vibrant. It tastes like lemonade, really, like I just squeezed it. Do you notice that different plant substances like lemon accentuate the properties of THC or CBD or any of those? Have you noticed any of that? Mm, I, haven't really, I haven't really looked at that that closely. Because I have a friend who's a potanist. She likes to mix different herbs and different substances with the THC for a different effect. Uh-huh. Thinks that some there's some chemical reaction to certain other terpenes, other smell molecules. Well, maybe she could be helpful in thinking about that. Well, I, I wonder if it, it accounts a certain point. Like, I'm, are these terpenes exclusive to the cannabis plant? No, or, not at all. So there you go. If you're talking about, you know, uh, yeah, there's a limonene. Limonene. Like lim that lim limonene and... Limonene, pinene... Linalool, which is lavender. Yeah. Caryophylline, which is the back note of pepper and clove. Stuff from mangoes. Mangoes, myrcene. So it seems to, it would seem to reason that something like a lemon drink, like the limonene in the lemon is going to be right. augmenting just the general dispersion of that terpene in the... In the old hippie lore used to be that you eat a mango after you inhale mm -hmm. and you get a stronger effect. Remember yeah. that? Do you remember that? I give that a hippie discount right off the bat. I don't know. I hear it. I hear it's the truth. I hear it's. I hear it's the truth. You know, the hippies were onto a lot of stuff. I was always told vitamin C, orange juice. The hippies are in the White House today. What do you mean? Wait, by what? That? What? I mean, wasn't Donald Trump some sort of, you know, sixties guy? I don't think so, man. If he was, he definitely was he doesn't cool show it anymore. 60s? He really rejected it. No, mm -hmm. I think he was big into Studio Fifty Four and Coke. I don't think he uh -huh. was. Uh, I don't think he was a hippie at all. Oh. He doesn't have any hippie quality to me. Yeah, I guess not. So when I first started doing this book, a lot of people said to me, you know, if it gets legal, it's going to take away all of the danger and the thrill aspect of of smoking pot or, you know, getting together. Well, that's, that's what white people say. <laughs> they were basically white people. Yeah, yeah what do you mean by that? It's fucking bullshit because the people who are going to prison are like black people and Mexicans and people who are, you know, pay for it for being illegal it's ridiculous so i mean they could get their thrill going to a whorehouse i guess or something like that it is a bit nonsense it's sounding total, total nonsense as far as i can see because to me like the more you know about this plant or the more you know about any plant the more freedom you have with it the more you can make choices and the more you you know stuff I, being educated to me is a benefit yes and having it be legal is sane because it having it illegal is just ridiculous yeah i mean you've talked to a lot of cannabis these are people who regularly consume cannabis in one form or another how many of them have told you oh yeah i do it for the thrill of it being illegal no yeah. obviously zero obviously yeah obviously zero so they're just going to keep keep going once it's legalized to You'll get a lot of people who will try it for the first time and the, you'll get the bell curve reaction and then it's just going to plateau back off and maybe a small percentage of people are like, hey, actually, this is great. I'm going to start doing this every day. But people who, who smoke pot every day are going to continue to smoke pot every day. People who aren't interested in it are going to continue to be not interested in it. That, yeah, but So there's also a whole entire group of people that might be interested in it once a week and to do five milligrams on a Saturday night before mm -hmm. they go out or go to a movie. That's exactly right. You know, there's plenty of people like that and the, way more people that want it than want to do it every day. Absolutely. That's just in the pure recreational sense. It's like if you have migraines or if you have seizures or if you have surgery or if you have cancer or if you have, you know, H I you know, if you have AIDS or your or whatever, you're if you're having a fucking problem, it really is a better solution than pain meds or all kinds of stuff that they give you sleeping medication 
there's a whole system in your body that you know the endocannabinoid system that 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 is understudied obviously and you know it has everything to do with pain management and all of that stuff swelling yeah. and it controls all of the other receptor systems in the body I guess yeah they call it. yeah yeah so are you still exploring the chemistry of all this yes very much i mean um you know i'm working with scientists and i guess uh you know, one of one of the things is that uh, the, the scientists that I've worked with are, are amazed that I figured out this sort of aspect of how to do this, and uh, so they're just putting language to the thing that I did in a way. Are these food scientists or or botanists or what kind of scientists are you working with? They're, you know, they're, they're uh, chemistry people and. Uh, exactly what kind of scientists they are i mean i really am completely uneducated about this <laughs> you're, a is, you're a cannabis savant basically is oh that it? i literally you know i started out sort of really being the president and ceo and the coo and all this stuff and i basically don't even have a job at the moment except for just to make stuff <laughs> <laughs> what what's the next nut uh, that you're looking to crack uh, on this front the next challenge well we that, really just want to get you know we want to get on shelves in legal states um we want people to understand the sort of value of controllable low dose product and sort of get away from the you know the, the sort of animal house you know get fucked up and you know play video game kind of thing mm -hmm. and uh you know, and a lot of people are trying to do that, put some sanity into the uh, uh, business. And I think there's going to be a lot of cool things coming out, and I hope that, you know, we're one of them. It'll be fun. One of the things that amazed me when I was doing the book was, um, you know, there was no standards of alcohol up until maybe 100 years ago. So you never knew what you were consuming. So a bottle of beer didn't ex we know now that a bottle of beer is equal to a glass of wine, which is equal to a shot of spirits. Mm -hmm. which we know it intuitively almost because we don't have to think about it. And that was the result of standardization. Mm -hmm. There's no standardization in weed at all. It's harder to standardize for one thing, but we never know how much we're taking. Well, this, these syrups and the sugars and the stuff that we're coming out with, really, it really is possible to standardize that. And it really is possible to be... To take it and not get the the Maureen Dowd effect, <laughs> you know, where you, <laughs> yeah, where you're just hysterical in your hotel room all night. Yeah, you ate like two candy bars and you were supposed to eat one square. Right, it's not good. <laughs> why is it like that? Why why is it that there's so like we were, you were talking about the gummy bears earlier? Who eats one leg of one gummy bear prohibition keeps people <laughs> stupid matthew it just it doesn't educate people nobody knows but it, it, at no point in the in the thought process of dosing gummy bears did anyone think you know i'd like to eat these by the handful no i know well that i mean that's where being a chef really comes in handy i would say because that's exactly what i'm i'm thinking i mean although <clears throat> you know the sugar you really only take a teaspoon, so, you know, but you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. You can make gummy bears with it. Yeah, and I guess being a chef, <laughs> <laughs> you can make, yeah, you Nailed can make. It. <laughs> and being a chef also is like, you know, if you put too much of something in, it ain't going to work. Right. Right? So measurements matter. Absolutely. Right? Could it be done with other condiment or ingredient? Like, could we do salt next? Uh, well, the thing I don't like about salt is that you use so little of it. So it's it's hard to sort of understand exactly what you're putting in there. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I, I guess if you, <clears throat> I mean, I think it is possible to do, but I, I, I find it to be, you know, there's a limit to how much salt you can have. You sugar can only use three, sure. three grains yeah. of salt. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, sugar, I mean, you can measure a quarter of a teaspoon. You could get into some serious math, I guess, that way, if you if you went with, like, salt and butter and these sort of 
cooking accoutrement to be able to prepare like oh we're gonna steak and green beans and potatoes yeah, and, and it's it gonna be 15 milligrams random, you know there's this really great show on called bong appetit mm -hmm. on vice yeah on vice it's it is great he does really cool stuff he talks to really it's super interesting people who do a great job um but when it comes to getting the cannabis into the food it's just this random, you know, people making shit up. You can tell they're like eyes are shifting. You know, they're like, <laughs> yeah, there's like three milligrams in that. <laughs> yeah, right. Good luck. You know, and and it's and it, it really is just a just random huge amount of ways that they do it. And in in each step of the way, there's there's I'm thinking there has got to be a controllable way to do that, both for sweet and savory and you know i haven't really addressed the savory yet anything else you'd like to discuss with us uh do you well, want to you want to plug your day job my day talk, job. talk about the restaurant i don't need to do that he okay doesn't want to no. yeah. <laughs> he doesn't want to but i'm yeah, not so ashamed of my day job you shouldn't be yeah no i mean bubbies come on down <laughs> <laughs> and done <laughs> Okay, I'm going to sound like the voice of reason here, but I think we need more people like her. I, agree. I think we need more people who are investigating and toying and, and playing with this stuff so we can really control our dose, really control what we're doing, actually really design the high that we want. What I'm, do you think? I, I completely agree because, you know, there's sure maybe a time and a place to where just taking as much as you can to the face and calling it the end of the day is fine. But there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of times where like, I don't want to just be blown out of my mind. I rarely do these days. I just want to be a little enhanced. So for me, he's, he's godsend, I think. And I think that's the post-prohibitionist way also. You know, I've always thought that this idea of smashing your face is a result of prohibition. Oh, like I agree. You, gotta, you know, you take as much as you can because it's illegal or you don't know when you're getting the next bit. And I think in the post-prohibitionist world, we can control what we do. We're, you know, we're adults. We want to use this stuff and we also want to use this stuff to have fun and be responsible yeah and sometimes you just want to eat an entire bag of gummy bears and survive and no problem with that too right there's times to obliterate the mind absolutely but there's also times just to lift it a little bit just as a little tease next week we have a really interesting two guests whose goal is to bring diversity to the cannabis movement i don't know if you've noticed but it's a lot of white guys it's a lot of white guys. <laughs> there's I mean, there's, there's, a few, there's a few women's organizations in it, but the lack of diversity in the industry is notable. And yeah. it's not only notable in this state, it's notable all across the board. Well, and I, it, it's, you know, I look forward to the opportunity to expand on this in the next episode, but I, I wonder if the diversity is not there or if by the nature of enforcement, and the nature of the inherent racism in enforcement if that diversity is just hidden from view. This is a really interesting point because I think if you're a person of color or the mother of a person of color, the mother of color, your take on cannabis is going to be different mm -hmm. because it typically, if you get caught, it's a ticket to orange. Mm -hmm. when I got, if I got caught, it's a slap on the hand. And I think that makes everything really different and I think our next guests next week are going to talk about this and be pretty enlightening about what their experience is like versus our experience. So we had the wonderful opportunity to speak with Jacob Plowden who is a representative of CCA. Cannabis Cultural Association. Based out of Harlem uh, as a young man, person of color and advocate for marijuana education, uh, understanding, vocal public Display an opportunity for people of color. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, well worth listening to. And we were joined. Uh, also, uh, he brought along his aunt Molly, who has a very unique perspective uh, that none of us will ever be afforded outside of speaking with her. She's also an advocate for CCA, and uh, they had some very interesting things to share with us. And I look forward to sharing that with our audience. So we'll see you next time. Um, thanks for listening this time. See you again. Thanks for listening to the Brave New Weed podcast. This episode and all future episodes are made possible by amazing listeners like yourself. 
If you'd like what you've heard, we encourage you to show your support by giving $1 a month for special access and rewards on patreon.com slash brave new weed. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at Brave New Weed. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Brave New Weed. And remember, you can always find more information about us or information discussed in each episode by pointing your favorite browser to bravenewweed.com. The name of my company is Relevant Innovations, and it's my goal to stay relevant and innovative. And that is all I want to do.